networking. I mean, we can get good speakers and, and talk about a lot of topics, but I think it is the discussion over lunch and during the breaks about what the speakers talk about that really helps much or more than the information that the, that the speakers give you themselves. I mean, talking to somebody that does your job in another county, you, you don't get a lot of opportunities to do that. Some of you are really good about networking amongst each other, but others, some of you don't, don't get a chance to get out of the courthouse much. Just not enough time. So uh, it's really great that, that uh, you're able to make it to these and, and be able to share your experience. So I'm standing between you and lunch with a presentation on third party considerations, dealing with others that, that you have to from a risk management standpoint. So I'm gonna try and make this as painless as possible, but I know this is a big issue for a lot of people in the room. How many of you deal with other people that, um, in your job every day that you have to make sure that they're safe they're not a county employee, but you need to, you're need you going to be responsible for them, and you're asking them and contracts and waivers and things. I mean, most of us have to deal with this. So as I go through this, and you have questions, go ahead and stop me, and we can have a discussion about it. Because again, these presentations are meant to bring out discussion more so than tell you the way it is. I'm not an attorney. Your county attorney is your attorney. And so, um, you know, get, get good ideas, get, get, uh, have discussions with others, um, but, but you really do want to make sure that when you're going back and implementing things, especially from a legal standpoint, the things we're going to talk about next, that you're reviewing that with your county attorney's office. Okay? So playing nice with others while you're protecting the county. This is a real balancing act, as many of you know, those of you who deal with contractors on a regular basis in the road department or construction projects that, that are going on. Um, it, you know, you, you, you have this balance of you need to protect the county taxpayers, but at the same time, you can only ask for so much from certain people uh, before you break their back and they just don't want to play with you anymore. So that's our discussion here is, is, is how are we going to maintain that balance? And so, first of all, who is it that we're talking about that, that, we're, that we need to deal with? Um, what are the risks that, that those different parties bring to us? Um, where do we look to identify the different risks that they bring? Because sometimes you're, you're working with someone, you don't really recognize what the risk is that they're creating for you as a county until the accident happens. And you never contemplated it prior when you had the chance to put something in the contract or something in their, uh, uh, the scope of your RFP, things like that. How do we protect the county? We'll look at that. How do we know what, uh, what to ask for? Uh, many of you are calling me on a regular basis. What, how much insurance do I need to ask these people for? And so we'll look at, at, at how you identify that um, short of having to call me each and every time. Um, and then uh, how do we balance limiting the risk with getting the job done? Because again, that is the balance, and at the end of the day, um, you're going to be taken to task when that person that you're telling you need to have $5 million of insurance and special insurance for the event that you're asking for, or you're just not using our facility, what do they do? They call the commissioner, right? <laughs> and now there's heat that no, this is going to happen, you need to work it out. So we'll talk about how we work it out. Parties that we deal with, there's a lot of them. And, 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 and of course we think about the contractor when you're gonna build a building, things like that, but there's a lot of others too. Product vendors that, that are selling things to you, but also product vendors that are selling things to other people at your venue. All those people who are selling their crafts and their food and things like that at the fair or at other county events or on the courthouse lawn. Uh, you know, they set up their, their craft show on the courthouse lawn without any agreement at all with the county. You know, we just had one of those a couple years ago. Craft fair had been setting up on the courthouse lawn every Memorial Day weekend for as long as anybody can ever remember. And there was no permit or no agreement with the county at all about how that worked. 
for why they were there or why they got to use that, that property. And then, unfortunately, the maintenance staff forgot that the craft show sets up on Saturday morning and the sprinklers went off. At the craft show. So it's not a good sight. Make Corby really crab crabby on Monday morning. <laughs> Uh, service providers that, that, again, provide services to you, or you might be in the middle of uh, uh, providing services to another, to health departments uh, are a good example, where you're in the mix of people that are going to be providing services to your constituents, and you're overseeing in that process of the services that they're going to be rendered. Subcontractors, and again, lots of us deal with the contractors, but we've got to remember all their subcontractors, people who are actually doing the work. Um, event participants, um, definitely a, a big group of people here in Utah. A lot of, a lot of special events that the counties are involved in. Um, groups at shooting ranges is one that uh, more recently has become a big issue because uh, we had the Public Shooting Range Act go into effect a couple years ago, which requires that you have to have your public shooting range open to the public. If it's used by a group, the statute requires that you have them have insurance uh, for the use of that public shooting range. So that's just one example of, it's not even your decision, it's mandatory that that, that person you need to have uh, certain requirements of. Parents are an issue, right? Um, they bring their kids to a lot of different events at the county and the, the recreation districts, the health departments, um, and of course, parents, you know, but, Forever, the idea behind limiting risk was have them sign a waiver. We're not responsible if, you, if there's any problem with the service we provide you. The problem with children is children can't sign a waiver, and parents can't sign a waiver on behalf of their children here in Utah. So how do you limit that risk with, with, the, with those uh, parents? Well, the parents can still waive their right. So you can still use a waiver for the parents to, to waive their right to sue you as the parents of the child. You still have to wait until the child reaches majority age and then they can bring their lawsuit and there's nothing we can do about that by way of a waiver. We just have to live with that. But you know, many of the claims we see with, with minors are the parents suing. I've lost the ability to spend time with my child. We used to sit out in the backyard and play ball at night. I can't do that anymore because they're in a wheelchair. They can waive their right to that lawsuit. Um, event directors and sponsors. And this has been a really big one in the last couple of years. That everybody wants to have a 5K. Everybody wants to have a 10K. Everybody wants to have a bicycle race. Everybody wants to have all kinds of different special events on the county's property or on the county road that they need a permit for. They have a large gathering uh, permit that they have to get. And they expect that they get to do that with no strings attached. I'm doing a great service to the community having this 5K, and it's a charitable event, and we don't have any budget, and so I can't provide any insurance. I can't sign a waiver. I can't sign an identification. We, we have to look at that and, and weigh how much responsibility should we put on the taxpayer to pay that claim when the race director is the one that's really in control of that type of, a, of, of a event. Um, other government agencies. How many of you have ever had a headache with indemnification and insurance requirements with the state, the BLM, the feds? <laughs> Uh, they can be some of the most difficult characters to work with out there as our, our, our counterparts in other agencies. Um, so so we'll, we'll talk about how we deal with those guys. Uh, donors and people that are willing to give you things, you know, sounds like a great deal a lot of times, but sometimes the free gift is free for a reason. Good example, Salt Lake County just a year or two ago, uh, the state, CITLA, was going to give them a piece of property in Salt Lake County just on the edge as you start up Harvey's Canyon. And there was some trails that, that went along um, through this, and so they were telling the county, we're going to sell you this piece of land for a dollar because the trail runs there, and we think it'd be better managed by the county. Um, you're already kind of overseeing the, the, that trail system that leads in, and there's a section that goes through our lands. So we're going to sell you it for a buck so that you can manage that trail system better. Isn't that fantastic? And the county thought it was fantastic. So what did they do? They paid them the buck, 
and they walked away and not no real agreements as to any issues with the land as they left it. Well, come to find out, the reason the state was unloading that piece of property was people would walk off the trail, just a few hundred yards, to a cliff where they would rock climb, which wouldn't present a horrible problem, usually, with the Recreational Liability Act, the Immunities Act. However, this rock wall was right over the entrance to I-80, going up Harley's Canyon. So the rocks that the climbers were loosening were falling right onto the entrance ramp. Was that donor a great deal? We need to think about that when people are offering us freebies. Uh, just how free is it? Uh, charities, again, people with small budgets, doing great work for the uh, for their constituency, so there's a lot of pressure for you to work with them, but again, they will bring risk to the county, and you need to consider that and limit it to the extent that you can, um, and figure out how you're gonna keep them on the hook, keep them having some skin in the game as well, so that they're uh, conducting their activities appropriately. Uh, volunteers. It seems like we don't have a risk management conference without talking about volunteers. It's a huge part of county government, so we'll chat a little bit about volunteers again today. Uh, regulated persons seeking permits. So it might, again, be somebody that isn't providing any real service or product to the county, but because you're in the regulatory loop, you create, you know, all of a sudden you're on the hook. Uh, example there, uh, when I uh, managed risk for the Minnesota County's Insurance Trust, the, um, one of our counties, Sherburn County in central Minnesota, uh, th they were part of a lawsuit because the local cable company uh, was putting in uh, fiber optic cable in, in the city. You know, big stuff back in the 80s. And so they had hired a subcontractor to go in and dig up a sidewalk so that they could get their cabling put in underneath the, uh, the, 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 the sidewalk. Um, and so the, the city was involved in permitting that subcontractor, the contractor, and then the sub, to be able to go in and rip up the sidewalk and get in there to, to put in their fiber optic cable. Well, this crew shows up, subcontractor crew shows up on a Tuesday morning with their backhoe to dig up the sidewalk, and they start digging, and this is a, a Main Street type uh, area where there are restaurants and, and stores right on the sidewalk. And it's about 11.30 in the, in the morning, and so the lunch crowd is just starting to begin to gather at the restaurants. And this, they were working right outside of one of the busier uh, uh, restaurants in this town, and they hit a gas line. It took out three of the stores completely, just rubble. Um, it, it, the name of the restaurant was the Courthouse Bar and Grill because the Sherburne County Courthouse and Administration Center, one three-story building and one five-story building, backed up to it on the back side. Almost every single window in both buildings was blown out from the concussion of the, of the gas line. And of course, the subcontractor had little or no insurance. They paid their limits out immediately. The contractor also had little or no insurance, so they paid their limits out immediately. Who paid the big bill? The city, because they gave the permit to be able to dig under the sidewalk and didn't check to make sure that the subcontractor knew that they needed to check and make sure what was under the sidewalk before they started to dig. So again, we get wrapped up into these real big risks for things that we really are just playing a regulatory role in uh, that we need to think about as well. Okay. So that's just a, a, a small list of the different people. Any any other additions to that? Yes. What's that? Yes. There there was one of the subcontractors that was killed. Luckily, that that was they three buildings. They they did um, the. Uh, the, the restaurant staff was out back having a smoke before the lunch rush started. Smoking <laughs> Yes, smoking does save lives. Very good. <laughs> yeah. um, but lots of 
lots of, I mean, we, we had dozens of uh, county employees injured when the glass blew in to their offices um, at the administration building. So there was a lot of injuries, but luckily only one got yeah, two minutes later. Yeah. That's what they say. If, they, if the lunch crowd would have shown up, but before that happened, it would have been a whole different situation. Um, so when we're talking about these different people, there's, a, there's several different areas that we need to think about the risk in. Uh, number one is injuries. So, uh, you know, we, we want to limit injuries to our employees and to others everywhere we can. So that's one of the first considerations that, that we want to take into account. Um, so we're talking about injuries to third parties, people, you know, the people sitting at the restaurant the workers in, in the courthouse that had really nothing to do with this but are injured and expect that somebody's going to take care of their medical expenses. Um, to your employees, um, we need to think about what risk to your employees do these other people bring, um, as well as to their own employees. Because when their employees are injured and they think that you should have done something, I mean, they can only get workers' comp out of their employer, but they can sue you if you haven't done things ahead of time to keep them from suing you. Um, property damage. Again, they can damage the third party's property, they can damage your property, or they might damage their own property. And you'd be surprised on how many contractors I see <coughs> that want their property and equipment paid for when they damage it doing services for the county. I want to damage my, my backhoe had I not been doing this work for the county. Yeah, uh, you collect that on the contract to, to, to do that work. But to have that, in, it, um, you know, uh, considerations for that in the contract is always the best way to go. Personal injury, uh, which is different than bodily injury. Personal injury is more uh, damage to their uh, reputation, damage, uh, copyright infringement, trademark infringement, those sorts of things. Um, Civil rights like harassment, discrimination type claims. Again, that could be against a third party. Um, it could be against one of your employees. How many of you are absolutely certain that all of your contracts with contractors and vendors that come into the courthouse or to your, your work environment, that that contract includes language regarding that vendor sexually harassing your employees? Are you certain you have that? Because you probably should double check and see that you do what's going to happen if they sexually harass your employees because you are responsible, right? For a vendor harassing your employees. The same as you are responsible if your employees harass that vendor's employees. Um, and then their own employees as well. So uh, in each of those areas, we need to consider the different people that can be harmed. So injuries can be caused by the actions of, of their employees. Um, it could be caused by a uh, product that they sell to you or to third parties. Um, again, if you use the fair example, you've got food that you can have problems with. Um, you've got electrical uh, hazards uh, at the fair, uh, fire hazards, um, and hazardous materials. You know, you, you, you think, uh, you know, I spent the weekend at Fox Elder County Fair, and you, you look around and you don't see, you know, they've done a really good job of making sure that, that the vendors are safe in, in that environment, that a lot of the electrical issues that used to be, be there have been taken care of and things looks really good, but you just never know what that hazardous material is. What, what, what are the one of the <laughs> little storytelling to yeah. do over lunch. Huh? Um, one of the worst county fair issues I ever saw was a, a, a booth where a woman was making children's clothing and blankets at, at, at home and selling them at, at the county fair. No big deal, right? Why, why would you need to ask somebody who's selling children's clothing and blankets at the county fair to have a whole bunch of insurance? Well, this again happened when I was in Minnesota. Um, under Minnesota law, you cannot sell children's clothing or blankets or bedware that is not flame retardant. And this woman sold a blanket to somebody whose child burned to death in their crib because the blanket started on fire. 
Marion, the county was involved in that lawsuit as well, as the, the woman who had no insurance other than her homeowners, which wouldn't respond because she was running a business that she didn't let them know about. Um, so the county ended up paying the tab on that. So again, sometimes the risks are not really evident. So you play it safe by asking everyone to indemnify us and have some level of insurance unless you can clearly see that there is no risk. And we'll, we'll get to that. Um, injuries caused by automobiles. Again, a very if, if that vendor or uh, event sponsor, uh, event organizer is going to be using vehicles, you really need to make sure that you've got language in the agreements uh, over uh, auto, auto liability insurance. Um, and then again, the subcontractors. We regularly forget about subcontractors. Um, property damage, uh, again, damage to uh, building and equipment. Um, Steve, can I use your example? Uh, Sevierstown, several years ago, doing a little remodeling on, on the administration building. I hired a contractor to, to do some remodeling. Um, one of the subcontractors comes in and was doing some hot work and started a fire. Not only damaged the part of the building that was under remodeling, but the, the rest of the courthouse, including the room where all the new voting machines were sitting. And uh, you know, as we went back and we started looking at the claim, you know, you said paid that claim to Perry County. Another paid the claim. Mail in voting. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, we had an at fault party, and, and the contractor, you know, right away said, oh, you know, don't worry about it. that sub was negligent. They started the fire. They, they need to take care of you. Um, and we've asked them, you know, we, we require them to have insurance as part of the agreement to be our subcontractor, but when Corby goes to the to that insurance company and says, okay, we paid this claim that your subcontractor started the fire, so you're going to reimburse Yusuf for that loss, the answer was, oh, no. the county signed a, 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 a hold on us, an indemnification agreement that they wouldn't, you know, we can work down their building and they won't sue us for it. And that's the way the AIA contracts read is if the, if, the, if the owner has insurance on the building and doesn't matter who causes the loss, you can't subrogate against the contractor or their subcontractors for damage done to that building if you use the standard AIA documents. So whenever you're going into a building con building. And for those of you who have been to some of these, you know that we say this every year. Involve us early. There, there are options in the AIA manuals um, to either have the contractor buy the, the insurance on the building while it's under construction so that then you don't have to worry about it. Their insurance company is going to take care of the building. Or um, you modify that language so that uh, it's clear that the county doesn't have insurance on the building. The county is self-insuring that building. And therefore, we can subrogate against you. And ultimately, Corby you know, negotiated very hard with them, and they did end up paying rather than having to go and test that in, in, in court. So we were able to recover some of that loss uh, to keep rates down for Sevier County and going forward. Um, so damage to building and equipment is a, is a big one. Uh, damage to vehicles. Um, yes. AIA documents. Architectural uh, Institute of America, I think is what it is. And I've, I've got all those uh, in my office. The, um, and regularly send out to the county attorneys what the optional language is to, uh, to utilize the um, Damage to business or reputation. Um, again, it, it may be to the county's reputation, if you have one. <laughs> Certainly you do. I mean, that's some of the worst part of some of these lawsuits, isn't it? It's not so much what we're going to have to pay out 
or all the time we're going to have to spend in depositions and stuff, it's the front page that hurts the county worse. And it's the loss of that uh, respect of the, your constituents in, in the county being able to do good work. Um, that's really tough. Uh, or it may be that you're damaging somebody else's reputation uh, or a vendor damages someone else's reputation or infringes on their trademark. Uh, you know, those things all need to be considered too as risks. Loss of data has become a big one, hasn't it? Um, it you know, there's lots of federal and state laws now that if you lose people's personal identification information or personal health information, um, you're in trouble. At the very least, you're going to have to notify those people, and those notification costs can be pretty significant. So if you're dealing with others who are either handling data for you, have access to data for you, or uh, have, are working on your system that secures that data, you want to have some language and think about that risk that because of the work they're doing, you may have a data loss claim that, that you have to deal with for the county. It was Summit County, right? That uh, you had a vendor selling county fair tickets. Uh, yes. 2014, right. yeah. yeah. We had that. And, uh, we haven't had any claims come against us because it's the same vendor that was doing Home Depot. And so I think a lot of people have targeted Home Depot and we haven't had any claims, but we have to keep it open just in case. And it was a rush job. They didn't have the right contract. Fortunately, this was before I came online. But, uh, you know, uh, and it's something that is the biggest red flag for us nowadays. And we're looking at all all options whenever it comes to anybody's personal data or credit card information. Right, right. And, it, and there's a risk that, again, we, we don't get to avoid it. Like, you know, one of Doug's recommendations was first look at avoiding the risk. Well, it's kind of a mandate. A lot of the data that the counties have, uh, you don't even you don't collect it for yourself so much as the state requires you to collect it and keep it and give it out when you need to um, manage it. Um, so it's one of those where we have to accept the risk, but we can reduce the risk um, through proper uh, securing of the data and, and again dealing with your with your vendors uh, that touch it. And then credit card theft uh, is another type of property damage um, that, that can occur. How many of you do have credit cards within the county? That county employees have yeah, also utilize credit cards. Um, so there's a good potential for that happening as well. Um, so that, that's a risk that, uh, again, if you're dealing with vendors, uh, just watch to make sure how, how, how much access they may have to use those counties' employees' credit cards. Uh, and the personal injury and civil rights. Again, Rival and slander. We've seen some of those claims where vendors have, have been involved with libel and slander uh, arguments uh, that the county gets drug into trademark and copyright infringement. And again, as we become more of an electronic world uh, with website design and things like that, um, we can both be guilty of it as well as our vendors can be guilty of it. I mean, how, how many of you, I, I don't, I do it all the time. I pull down photos off the internet to put in my slideshow, right? I'm violating trademark and copyright infringement all day long doing that. You need to have permission from that photographer to use their photograph unless it's clear online that, that they give you permission to use it. Um, and again, we don't think about it much. Um, at the very least, when you have vendors doing that type of website design things for you, make sure it's in that contract that if they are, if they do violate somebody's copyright or trademark infringements, that's on them. They're going to identify the county for it. Uh, discrimination, harassment, wrongful detention, um, invasion of privacy, all of these types of personal injuries are also things that regularly, even as a risk manager, I, I forget about them. You're thinking about the injuries and the property damage, and you forget about some of these things uh, that we really do need to be thinking about as, as we're dealing with vendors. And then criminal acts. It's another area, uh, I mean, you don't think about the traditional risk manager that deals with purchasing insurance for their entity, 
and dealing with claims to their insured, but isn't a vendor that commits a crime while they're doing work for you a risk to the county? Again, that's front page news. And so you want to consider those risks um, around fraud, theft, assault and battery, molestation, all of those things. I mean, people that are using county funds to do work, do they have proper fraud protection? and proper uh, employee dishonesty coverages and things like that are all things that need to be worked into your agreements with that. So, kind of know who it is we're talking about. We kind of, we, we have a good, better handle on what it is, the types of risks that they bring to us. So let's talk about how we control those risks. And uh, first of all, when we're talking about a lot of the Vendors, contractors, subcontractors, we've got the contract. That's our method to, to control the risk. Um, the, the biggest area that we can uh, control risk uh, through the indemnification hold harmless language uh, in those. And again, uh, just be careful that you're just not using standardized language that somebody cut and pasted out of another contract that uh, a, a local business uses because you're not local businesses. You're government agencies. So your indemnification language should be a little bit differently than the, the, the warehouse down the street uh, or the auto repair shop down the street. Um, or, you know, certainly San Juan counties might be differently than Utah counties. The size of the county and the, and the types of things that you do uh, will make those indemnification. And the person that you're working with uh, will run decide how, what that identification language needs to include. So again, it's always a good idea, each individual contract, to sit down and chat with your county attorney and, and get me involved if you'd like to, to talk about what is it that we need to make sure this contractor is protecting us for um, under this, these search, uh, situations. And then also insurance and bond requirements because we're going to ask them to indemnify us, pay more or less pay us back for any claim that we have as a result of their work. We want to make sure that they can make good on that promise, right? And it's easier to have them have insurance for that than to take their backhoe or to take their business away from them in order to have them indemnify us. So we're going to ask for some insurance requirements or if not insurance, bond requirements. Um, and, and so that's always a trick. How much? What is it? What insurance do they need, and how much? And we'll we'll look at that uh, here in just a few minutes. Um, when we don't have a contract, like we're dealing with people coming to the fair, um, we have other ways uh, of, of dealing with these with those types of parties that we're not in a contractual relationship with. Um, waivers are probably the most commonly used way of of dealing with those types of folks. And I know a lot of people say that waivers aren't worth the paper that they're written on. And in front of certain judges, that's absolutely true. But the, you know, the every now and then when the, where the judge says, you know, it's clear the party's intent was to waive their right to the claim. So we're not going to allow them to continue to bring this claim. And when we are able to stack that waiver on top of governmental immunity and, and things like that, it's, it starts to waive the, the claim in the county's favor. Um, so uh, what's the harm of having them sign a waiver? If it turns out to be useless in a particular case, it still isn't, um, isn't uh, negative for us. It's just not as useful as we'd like it to be. The one waiver you never try to do is have somebody waive their workers' comp rights. Because <laughs> that'll get you in trouble. <laughs> And I've seen a few people try that. Um, not, not any of the folks in this room. <laughs> um, uh, insurance requirements. Again, uh, even though we might not have a contract with someone, if we're allowing them to be on our property, or we're giving them a permit, or otherwise we're in a regulatory capacity with them, um, our ability to ha have them have insurance can help at least create a buffer between us and that third party. Um, if there's uh, enough insurance 
from the other party to take care of their medical expenses and something to you know get a down payment on their new car uh, maybe they'll never get to the point of looking for anything from the county um, so always look for the ability to to ask those people to have insurance so i'm just trying to plug what you're saying into really mm -hmm. so when we uh, run a pipeline in an oil company and needs to dig up our road mm -hmm. you know when i've done the encroachment permit I, you're responsible for signing and, and uh, public safety and all this but i don't think we don't require a bond so is that kind of what you're saying that we should yeah especially when they're when they're on your uh, you know because a lot of your roads they, they could damage the whole flood management system right when they're digging up ditches and things that or have the car driving that, you know, you, that lots of different things that could happen so for the car driving into the construction zone and they didn't sign it properly you want them to have good insurance um, but for the damage to the, the ditch which also acts as flood management you might want to have them have a bond so that if they did damage it and they are they say i'm not going to come back and fix that I, I i'm already losing money on this contract i'm not coming and fixing your ditch now the bond is going to come and fix your ditch and then the bond company will deal with that and collect you back from that we should require them to have both properties or depending on the circumstances yeah there's property there that they can damage that um, you want to protect that's not necessarily yours it's either yours or a third party's you have 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 that uh, a bond is another option beyond insurance because some insurance policies are, it might be things that an insurance policy that they hold isn't going to cover so then you can use the bond but now you're thinking about it that's good <laughs> that's what this is for um, asked John you have a lot of um, oil field companies that will we have lots of miles of their road kind of like these guys and mm -hmm. just go to well sites and whatnot and it's considered county roads but a lot of times I mean, we don't see those roads for months sometimes mm -hmm. and the oil field companies are generous enough to go out and fix those roads by themselves is there some you know, maybe like a master agreement with them or a master contract of sorts to say it's okay if you fix roads X, Y, and Z, but don't touch A, B, and C. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it, well, we want the help because we can't get out of it. Right. Right. So, in exchange for them having better access to their fields, they're going to provide you some service by grading the road, keep maintaining it for you. Um, seems like a reasonable exchange where you have a contract, and in that contract, you just have them indemnify the county that if the maintenance work that they do on the road causes a claim against the county, that they're going to indemnify the county for that. Um, if, if that's the way you want to go. Um, or if they do damage to the road or to somebody's third, uh, third party's uh, property, they're, you know, they're pushing off dirt, they break a bunch of fence posts. Um, that, again, that they're gonna, their insurance is going to cover that identify the county for any claim against the county. Again, it's that balancing act of how much do you want them to help out in the maintenance of the road versus how willing are they to do things like that. If they're just not willing, then you just have to, again, decide if you're going to accept the risk or not. So before we go any further, let's, let's make sure we've got our terminology correct. Um, and just a few je definitions. When I talk about general liability, and a lot of people throw this term around to mean any kind of liability at all. It's general. Every type of liability. And some people even refer to it in our, in our field as public general liability. Um, and, and what general liability is, from an insurance geek's point of view, is that bodily injury and property damage. And it includes within the, the, the uh, uh, bodily injury, there's some personal injury too for the trademark infringement, um, copyright, libel, slander, those types of things. So the general liability policy, that's all it's going to cover. So when you tell somebody, 
I need you to have a $2 million general liability policy, and then you ask for workers' comp, and you think your work is done, you've missed a whole bunch of risks that aren't covered by the general liability policy because it isn't going to cover molestation. Many of them won't cover sexual harassment. Many of them won't cover any type of employment-related issues. Uh, and you just have a separate employee liability policy. Most of you aren't you know, familiar with that because we just fold that into our liability policy. We don't have it separated out for you. We try to make that easier for you. Um, so be careful if you're, uh, with that terminology. General doesn't mean everything. General pretty much just means injury to the person, either bodily injury or personal injury to the person, and property damage. All the other types of civil rights types claims and things like that, that can be the really big dollar claims you need other coverage for. Uh, and products liability. Many general liability policies do not cover products liability. So when you ask that food vendor to just have general liability, workers' comp, when somebody gets really sick from the food that they bought from that vendor, that vendor has no insurance for it. They need to have products liability either added to their general liability policy or a separate products liability. Um, likewise with contractors that are building things um, or vendors that are selling you things. You want to make sure that they have products liability for uh, you know, when your employee is electrocuted by the piece of equipment that you bought from that vendor, that they have products liability insurance to pay for that claim. Um, errors and omissions liability is the coverage that I talked about that's excluded from general liability for civil rights violations, um, harassment, those sorts of things. Um, in our world, we call it public officials liability. We don't like to use errors and omissions. It's not, not friendly language uh, when we're talking about it. elected uh, uh, public servants. Uh, so we, we call it public officials liability. Um, personal injury liability we've talked about. Again, that's sometimes separate from the general liability policy. Again, you're dealing with a lot of people who are just trying to meet the bare minimums to be able to get that contract with the county or to be able to have their event. And so they're buying the cheapest insurance they can find. So what's the cheapest insurance you can buy, Marty? The policy that excludes everything, right? <laughs> it's all about the exclusions and a lot of Chief general liability policies will exclude employment practices, it will exclude uh, uh, the personal uh, injury, it will exclude errors and omissions, it will exclude uh, that personal injury liability. So if you're not looking really closely at it and asking or requiring that they include that, they probably aren't going to because that's not the cheapest policy they can buy. Um, completed operations. Again, any contractor that you work with that's, that's performing work for the county, you want to make sure that their liability insurance either is endorsed with completed operations or they have a separate completed operations policy. We'll talk about which one of those you want to do. Um, because otherwise, they, they finish their work, they walk off the work site, something goes wrong afterwards, their insurance company is not on the hook for anything that happens after they're done on your site unless they have completed operations. Uh, special events liability. And this is one that I deal with you guys all the time on, with the fairs and other events that happen on county property. Again, a lot of the things that these people want to do on the county's property are not covered by a general liability policy. They have to get a special policy. Bicycle races, 5Ks, um, climbing walls, bounce houses, houses, right? <laughs> <Bounce houses. laughs> houses. No, no, no. Uh, again, you got to. If you want to take the time to look at each and every one of the policies and make sure that you are aware of every exclusion that they have on their policy, um, you can do that, or you can just make sure that in the requirements you're, you're uh, requiring special events liability coverage, or the event that they're holding is endorsed onto their liability policy, and look at that specific endorsement. 
and, and again, a lot of a lot of the events that you're going to deal with, that's the only way they're going to be able to get insurance is through a special events uh, policy. Uh, events that you have that you do, do you joint uh, ownership or like the city and the county and the special services are together are doing and then so is it just yeah. have one say we're taking this? You, you, you can do it you can do it a couple of different ways. But when we're dealing with other public agencies, um, you can you, you, you the cleanest way from my perspective is if you're doing it regularly like you're holding in the uh, 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 vernal days, dinosaur days, every single year, and it takes three months to plan and, and execute, and another month to, of cleanup after the fact, and the board is meeting on a regular basis to, to plan it, create an interlocal. And in the interlocal, you decide, is one entity going to be responsible for this? Are the three different entities going to each take their own uh, liability, uh, and, and we're going to separate out the liability so that the county isn't responsible for something that the city employee did for this event. Um, that's one way of doing it. You can use mutual aid. It's not as clean as interlocal. Um, or, you know, but for years it's just been done by a handshake. But, and again, then you get hard feelings when there's a claim. And, and F, all the entities are involved and it was one of the entities, employee, that was doing something they shouldn't have been doing anyway, that caused this injury, and the other two, you know, the, the city and the county are saying, well, it was the district employee that did this. Why are we involved, and why are we going to pay the bill because we have more coverage than anybody else? Because with joint and several liability in Utah, you don't have to be the most negligent party to pay the biggest dollar amount. And we often get into that situation where, again, because we don't offer nuisance uh, settlements to people, we, we assertively uh, defend the, the county's claims, the other parties regularly sell out quick. And so we're left. And so we always have to be cognizant of that, that we may end up holding the bag. Now, luckily, that you know, we had one, one or two judgments against the county in the eight years I've been here. Rarely do, do the courts find that the county is negligent and we have to actually pay a judgment. Um, but we have to be cognizant of that, that we might be the last in line to get hold, caught holding the bag. Okay, and then cyber liability, again, that potential for loss of uh, data, that's not covered under general liability. Uh, the uh, insurance service office, ISO, writes insurance policies for the industry, and then the insurance in, the insurance carriers use their forms because ISO gets their forms approved by the commissioners of insurance in each state, and so it's easier for the insurance companies to just use those forms that are already been approved rather than writing their own form and taking it to each insurance commissioner in every state they want to write insurance in to get their insurance policy. The ISO forms now exclude all types of data loss, cyber liability losses. As of uh, March of 2014, I think it was, when they implemented that, that change. So now you have to buy a separate cyber liability policy. Okay, so we need to ask for that separate, rather than just under general liability. So that's a lot. And it's taken me almost 30 years to get to this point, to know how much to ask for and what to ask for. And so I don't expect that all of you are going to be able to pull that out of a hat to be able to know what to ask for. And we're doing it all day in every single department. So we need the tools to be able to um, make sure that we're asking for the right things on a regular basis. Um, because the requirements are gonna be different uh, depending on the type and the level of risk that each person that we're dealing with, what the risk is that they bring. Somebody who's simply handing out vote for me pamphlets at the fair is different than a different risk than the food vendor or the guy who's selling chainsaws and, and showing people how to use them at the county fair, right? Uh, or even the, the pony rides. 
much different risk than the guy handing out a book for me. Um, so we, we need to consider that as we have these requests for uh, insurance. Uh, displays, again, without products or, or contests, uh, present a very limited risk. Athletic events, races, contests, all of those things have a much higher general liability risk for bodily injury or property damage, um, but they may also create that special event uh, risk. Um, you know, recently I worked with several counties trying to get their insurance put in place for uh, being a uh, uh, start or finish line sponsor for the Tour of Utah. And, it, you know, that was, there, there were two carriers in the U.S. that were willing to even quote that coverage, and then Lloyds of London. That's it. People, the insurance industry does not like bike races. They don't insure bike races anymore. And it was pulling teeth to get policies to cover these couple counties that wanted to be involved in Tour of Utah. Um, but uh, we got it done because that's People want the Tour of Utah happening. It's a lot of pressure on the counties, even though you know it should be the other way around. The Tour of Utah should be indemnifying the county and saying, if, if our race causes a claim against the county, we're going to cover you. But they don't do it that way. They do it, we want you to sponsor the finish line and the start line. Oh, and by the way, if we get sued, we want you to pay the claim. Very interesting. Uh, quite a debate uh, uh, at the governor's office that I'm involved in uh, over how that will continue to happen going forward because the county counties are having a real tough time uh, getting that done. And some of the county attorneys are just simply balking at, I'm not, I'm not approving this contract as to form and, and uh, 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 compliance because I don't think it complies with, with the laws of the state of Utah. So. Um, and then vendors selling products is the other big one that we deal with all the time. Um, and again, we need to take a look at what is the risk that they're creating to the public that they're selling their products to, to the county's equipment and property uh, that they're using, um, and to their own, to themselves and their employees. So to, to deal with this, um, I've been working for years now, many of you have worked with me on individually, this contract, what do we get? Um, but it, it comes up so often that w what I've done is created a couple of matrices for you. The first is the contracts. County contract insurance standards. And what this is, is, when you are dealing with a, you're going to enter into a contract with a vendor or a service provider, um, just sets out, you know, the purpose for the policy. Um, you know, the county can be held liable for injuries. You know, again, injuries are typically um, state claims, so they're limited by the tort cap. So for any individual that you injure, um, the county can be sued for up to $717,100. Any number of people that are injured in the same occurrence, you might have to pay out as much as $2,455,900. Um, for all the people that get injured combined. Um, so that's the risk to the county. So when you ask somebody to have a $2 million insurance policy, and they're going to identify the, the, the county, and they have a really serious injury where several people are injured, and they have a $2 million policy, did you ask for or not? Because remember, who's that policy going to respond to first? The claim against the named insured, which is not you. You might be additional insured if you ask for it, and we'll talk about if there's some reason why you wouldn't want to be, but you're, you're going to be next in line, if there's anything left of that policy, to pay the obligation to indemnify, and you might need to be indemnified up to two and a half million dollars. And that's as of July 1st of this year, 
um, the, again, the legislature is seriously looking at significant increase to those tort caps in this next legislative session. One legislator is bent on that. He is bringing a bill to do away with the tort cap. And we will have unlimited uh, liability, which is really scary. Because as a taxing entity, there really is no limit. Uh, luckily, we don't see a lot of those claims. And the, the information I provided the legislature was, you know, in the 25 years that, that USIP's been around, we have had one claim where the damages that the jury found for exceeded what the tort cap was. That was in our first year of existence in 1992 when the tort cap was $100,000. And that it, the person had $140,000 worth of injuries. Hasn't, hasn't been a problem. There's only been a few claims against the state and the university system, which is all state risk management, where they had multiple people injured in one injury and the two and a half million dollars wasn't enough. So for a handful of injuries, we're going to do away with any limitation. So hopefully we can convince the legislature to not go too crazy this issue. But again, uh, what we need to make sure of is that um, when we look at the risks that these people present, that we're uh, asking them to identify as first of all, that they have enough insurance to be able to make good on that promise. So we have um, the introduction and the process um, that, that you go through. Um, you determine whether your contract will require insurance provisions. Most of them should. Uh, and, uh, and the different conditions that you want to put on that. And uh, here, kind of kind of try to stride it between low risks, you know, moderate risks, and high risk type activities that you're going to be involved in. Um, and then you set your, your insurance requirements accordingly. Um, if the insurance is required, you want to find the type of insurance that's required, again, depending on what they're doing, if they're selling food that's not prepackaged, you know, if they're selling cans of Coke and Twinkies in the wrapper, the product's liability isn't as big of a deal as it is when they're selling home-baked goods, right? And if they're selling home-baked goods, they're probably in violation of the public health code, right? <laughs> <laughs> But it doesn't, does it happen at our fairs and events? Unfortunately, it does. You know, I, I really think this is a, a bigger deal than, than most candidates realize. Um, just from a public health standpoint, we want every one of those to have a food handling permit, but they don't always get that. So there is a risk there, unless they're, well, there's always a risk there, but that if they have a food handling permit, that limits the risk. And, and, and if counties would require that, that helps us as, a, as the regulatory agency but it also helps you. Right, right. Because there was just a recent Supreme Court case on that permit immunity under the under the law because it has been that if if you get sued because you either provided a permit or didn't provide a permit, in this case, you, you had somebody selling their home-baked cakes at the fair and um, that there was no food handler's permit, well, or you issued a food handler's permit and that person still got sick, you had immunity because you provided a permit. Um, and the, the recent case, what the courts found was, that works as long as you aren't the one that created the requirement for the permit. We don't want you creating this immunity by saying, well, the, the county's gonna require itself to permit every vendor at the fair, and now that we provide the permit to the fair vendor, we don't have any liability whatsoever because we provided the permit. The, the, the case law now is some higher level has to require the permit, and then you have immunity when you issue it. So in Jeff's case, if the counties require that the health department issue those permits, and he does, he has immunity for it. And any of the permitting that the state requires of the county, again, you have some immunity for when you issue those permits. Does that then go back into the higher agency that required it? Is that where the liability those two? Usually not. It's hard working uphill with, for that because again, they, they may have required you to, to, to issue the permit or, or to have a permit process, but it's your permit process 
and the decision to, to provide or not provide that permit is yours, so they're going to leave the liability with you. Another unfunded mandate. <laughs> yes. We've got uh, the lady that shows up every morning with briefings that are required by, by can the county be held liable for allowing that to happen, or are we okay? Well, if, if, if you know that Hello. she's in violation of the health thing because she doesn't have the permits, you should probably be reporting that. But again, anybody can sue for anything in this day and age, right? So your employee gets jacked ill from the burrito that they bought from the food truck that stopped by at the county uh, road shop, and when it's been happening for years and everybody knows that they don't have a food handler's permit to be stopping and selling those, those burritos, yeah, you might be named in that lawsuit, and we might spend $10,000 to have you thrown out a court on that. So again, a lot of our defense costs are not defending whether or not you were negligent or not. It's just getting you thrown out when the case against you is not even existent. We spend a lot of money on that. Um, so we've got this first piece that is more or less the county's policy on how they set this, the contract insurance requirements. Um, there's a bit of a primer on what is uh, a low hazard, uh, a standard hazard, a high hazard, um, and for each one, it identifies what types of coverages you're going to ask for. So even for a low hazard event, you, you are still going to ask for commercial general liability, uh, commercial auto liability, and workers' compensation. And again, the minimum that I suggest is uh, half a million dollars per occurrence and a million dollars aggregate. That's the one to use when there's a huge amount of pressure on you from the powers that be at the county to make this thing happen. Is that's the minimum that you'd ask for. And to tell you the truth, it's pretty hard for anybody to buy less insurance than that. Uh, for the general liability. Anybody that can't get a million dollar policy They've had some experience that you probably don't want to be working with that contractor or that person anyway. So that should be an easy buy. You may not be able to answer this, but what's kind of the general cost of a policy like that? It all depends on the type of business that you're talking about. Uh, you know, somebody that's uh, yes, yeah. If, if, if they're a consultant and they're just offering advice and it's not in a profession. Pretty cheap. Uh, a subcontractor with a backhoe or doing hot work, pretty expensive. But for a consultant, you'd, you'd stick with the 500000 Again, it's the type of consulting that they're doing for you. Yeah. That, that's one of the things that I, I'm still dealing with is we came in, the contract says sufficient insurance. And, you know, general liability, workers' compensation. And so, all the people as I come and say we need the certificate insurance because they get the contract that's on our boilerplate, get it with it, and then they forget to get the certificate of insurance. And so that's one thing that I've kind of had to pound on saying bring these in, make sure before they start, and then they ask the question at what level. Well my experience with Salt Lake City it's like two million. But then you get the the artist doing a bronze statue for to, to put up at a rest area. Mm -hmm. They're self-employed, no workers' comp, no real insurance, and they're like, well, how much real insurance? And yeah. it's like, so I'm loving the idea of this matrix, but... Uh, yeah, because again, by setting, by having some standards, you know, you, you set the groundwork for the people who come in, because we hear all the time, well, nobody else ever asked me for this. I just did this up in New England County, they didn't ask me for all of this. So, and, and sometimes, <laughs> but, but I hear that one all the time. And whether it's true or not, they use that excuse. So by saying, well, it doesn't matter what you get asked for elsewhere. This is our county's policy. We're going to protect our taxpayers. And we have a policy that sets certain minimal requirements. and, and 
additional requirements based on the level of risk you bring. So when they say, they may say, well, another county doesn't ask me for this, the city doesn't ask me for this, but they also might say, well, I know Dave, my brother-in-law, just did some work for the county, and he, he, you only asked him for a half million dollar policy, you're asking me for two million. Well, you know, Dave did a two-day project for our IT department, and you're going to dig up one of our ditches on a road, on a busy road. Okay. There's a difference there, and that's what our policy contemplates, and that's why we're asking you for a different amount than we did your brother. I own a theater in San Juan County, and the liability insurance, million dollars, for just being right now that if somebody bites an old maid and breaks their tooth, and but for to answer your question, the cost of that is about fourteen hundred dollars a year per month, which is a big portion of what the budget, right? So that again, that's why you need to have some justification behind what you're asking for, because they will they'll, they're going to they're going to squeak about having to buy these policies. So if your popcorn vendor at your fair. <laughs> Yeah. Again, a standard level risk. So that, that low level risk, and as we go through the matrix, you'll see that is stuff like the, the, you know the people that are just showing their quilts at the fair. They're not selling them. They're not you know doing anything like that. They're just there. But someone might trip on the cords that they have going to their booth. Um, the person behind the booth might sexually harass them, uh, things like that, that minimal amount of insurance. Um, then we get to the standard, which would be a million dollars per occurrence, uh, $2 million aggregate. And again, this, this whole, we'll, we'll talk about the, the aggregate uh, issue, um, because a lot of you, as the, the counties, aren't familiar with the aggregate. Uh, on insurance because you don't deal with it. Um, but the people that you're working with the, that are buying these policies, when, when you say a million dollar aggregate, you know, that vendor might be at 30 or 40 different events throughout the year. And that million dollars might already be used on claims that were filed against them for other events earlier in the year by the time that they show up in October for your event. But they have a million dollar aggregate policy. They meet the requirements. So you need to be careful about the, those, those aggregates, how much you're asking for, and language about depletion of the aggregate. Um, and then the high risks, again, I have here two million per occurrence, three million aggregate. It, it sounds like the, the, the draft of the, of the bill to the legislature this year uh, will start out at a $10 million uh, torque cap. Uh, so if it does go to that, that's probably going to jump to $3 million, $5 million at a min, you know, for high risk. It's the minimum for a high risk. You want to get 10 or 15, because again, it's got to pay the claim against that other person too, not just you. This isn't all your insurance. Okay. And then, for some of you, uh, there is an NR not required. There, there, you will have some people that ask them for insurance. It really is, it, it's, it's questionable. Yes, they present a risk. Anybody that's on county property presents a risk, but there might be some people that it's, it's better to just move forward, accept the risk, deal with it. Um, so we built that in. Uh, and then the special coverages also is, a, is the other area of risk that, that you're going to deal with. So we get to the matrix itself. And here I worked with Salt Lake County and this is uh, based off a model that, that uh, Jeff Rowley and uh, the risk manager in Salt Lake County uh, has worked on too. And so we think we have most every type of contract that a county might enter into covered here. With it showing what the level of risk is, whether it's low, high, standard, not required. So if you're purchasing an auto for someone, 
you don't need to ask for insurance from the person you're buying a, a car from. Do you, do you ask for the dealership to give you a certificate of insurance when you buy a car from them? No, why would the county? Now, depending on the deal that you're making with purchase of that vehicle might change the risk. Um, a lot of counties all of a sudden are leasing their vehicle um, rather than purchasing them. Um, and they're, so that changes the whole uh, issue there. Uh, you might need to ask that leasing company uh, for, some, for some insurance. Um, so again, You'll, every now and then you'll run across a variable. Here we've got the community development block grant. Different grants have different requirements, as, and some of them might be insurance related. So the provision here is whatever you need to do to comply with the grant is primary. And then if you want to ask for additional insurance beyond that, you, know, that, you, know, you go to the matrix to determine if you're going to ask for anything more. Okay. So again, as we go through here, and I know that some of you are already thinking, oh, I'm going to find the one that Johnny makes. <laughs> and you will, and we'll add it so that you have this available to you um, and, and have that resource so that uh, when, when, I'm, when I'm off uh, uh, riding my motorcycle across the country and not available, that you guys can find me and or you can use this model to at least get your RFP put in because, again, don't wait for the contract. If you are going into an RFP process, put these requirements in the RFP, because otherwise that contractor is going to come back and say, what do you mean I need a $5 million policy? That wasn't in the RFP. Uh, why, why I can't live by my bid now. And especially when you're talking about building contractors, getting that whole thing with the AIA documents and stuff, if you're going to have them buy the builder's risk insurance on the building so that you don't have subrogation issues, make sure that's in the RFP. Mm -hmm. And I love that method because, again, the, the contractor that comes back and says, oh my god, that's, that's a killer. Can't you buy the builder's risk? Because the builder's risk blows me out of the water from a bid standpoint. Again, that contractor's had some claims. That's why he can't buy reasonably priced builder's risk insurance. It just screened out that contractor from your RFP process. Or at least well, he's a higher price. In the RFP, you're bidding the top of too. Yes. The other bidder. Right. And law does prohibit them from taking any kind of a middleman's fee or commission on that policy. So whatever they're actually paying for the builder's risk policy, they can't add to it. To say that they won't try, but they're not supposed to. Okay, so. All right. Then we also have a section on special coverages, and it goes through and identifies the different types of special coverages that you might have. Uh, security and patrol liability, products liability, garage liability, if you're housing and fixing other people's vehicles. You know, I've had counties in the past that had programs where bring your vehicle in and we'll get it fixed up for you, um, especially if it doesn't pass emissions testing. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll work to get your car running for you. Um, some counties do some really bad things for their, for their constituency. Um, dram shop or liquor liability is another one that more and more counties are running into. And when I first got here eight years ago, it seemed every county's policy was no liquor anywhere on any county property. And that's been changing. So remember liquor liability. Bankers professional, child care, daycare services, um, uh, special Special insurance there, standard general liability policy or their own homeowner's insurance policy is not going to cover daycare stuff. So again, you can refer to this um, with, with different people that you're working with and see, is there a special type of coverage that I need to be asking for in addition to the, to the general liability? And there's the builder's risk. Aircraft liability, drones are not covered by a general liability policy. So if you have someone flying to map for your county uh, or check out damage um, to, to the county, doing any of those sorts of things, uh, videoing events, um, make sure that they have aircraft coverage for their drone. Okay. What if, the, what if, me, if your county owns one? 
if your county owns one, again, they're considered an aircraft, insurance policies exclude aircraft liability from the general liability. So you have to have a separate aircraft coverage. Now, for the counties, you said we endorsed our general liability to cover drones. Um, and, you know, we, uh, through our reinsurer, County Reinsurance Limited, uh, that NACO created, so all the county pools in the country join together and have a, a reinsurance company. They set this up, but they require us to schedule the drone. And the scheduling requires that you have your certificate of authority number and you know, all the other pilot's license information and things like that, which the counties can't get because the backlog on getting those COAs and things is, and, or waiver is, is horrible. So at our last board meeting, our board approved that for unscheduled drones that you're waiting for the COA, you've got defense coverage. $100,000 of defense coverage so that we don't leave you hanging that if you are in that process and you don't have that information, um, also if you uh, just forget to call us. You know, we've got coverage for unscheduled buildings. We cover unscheduled autos, uh, you know, for, because you know that you didn't mean it but you missed it we, we cover those because we're here to protect the county and so we figured we should protect them from the unscheduled drone too where the land department forgot to tell the risk coordinator that they just bought a drone you at least got a hundred thousand dollars of, of uh, defense cost which should be more than enough to have the county dismissed from that claim because with governmental immunities and things of that sort you should be uh, dismissed for most of the claim. That's where most of our claims have been going uh, over the years with these with UCIP is just dismissed uh, based on immunities. Johnny, on the, on, the, on the drone, remember that you have a blanket COA, which is basically for training purposes and that type of thing, and then there you have to have a specific COA for like for us for the law enforcement to use it for law enforcement search and rescue functions the land people to use it for land-based functions such such as that. So right, you, you got it. Just because you put a blanket COA in place, don't think that covers you. <laughs> yeah. The, the FAA and the state have really got us going on this thing. Yeah. So. And, and Box Elder was one of the first counties that admitted they had a drone. <laughs> so I've worked, with, <laughs> I've worked with their economic development director who runs the train site there. And that was the other issue was when the county is the train site, you're flying other people's drones that you don't own. You don't have the COA on that drone because it's not yours. So the first time that, that, that uh, they called up and said, we're going to fly the university's drone for training, is like, okay, um, well, you need to have coverage on it. The FAA is saying the person who's actually operating the drone is the person that's going to be liable, not necessarily the owner. The owner might be as well. So that's another reason why we put this unscheduled drones coverage in place was for when you are flying somebody else's drone because you are the training center. Okay? So it's, again, one of those band-aids that if you need more coverage, you simply schedule the drone. And then you've got a full... Five million dollars of coverage. For that well, and Johnny, or you want. we do need to have the training sites scheduled as well. So not only do the drones need to be scheduled um, under all of your exposures, but also if you're doing a testing site, we need to know that as well because our um, reinsurance carrier yeah. is putting, you know, unowned drones as also a coverage. So those need to be scheduled. Right. And actually, tomorrow at 10, we've got the attorney that Fox Elder County has, has been working with, um, whole presentation on drones, because it's a big issue. As government agencies, you know, the rules are much different for you. you know, I got a bunch of calls. People were so relieved to hear that the FAA come up, came out with their new rules uh, for commercial drones that was going to make life easier to get your COAs, or not have to get your COA before you fly. And the pilot's requirements were much less. The problem is that's for commercial drones. Publicly owned drones are different than commercial drones. So we have to wait until those those same standards uh, are adopted for publicly owned drones. 
Okay, so we've got the special coverages covered. Uh, we then have, if you have, are going to use the standard requirements, here's your language for the contract. At least your draft language for the contract. Again, the county attorney is your attorney. So when, when you have a, a, a vendor that you think the standard insurance requirements are the appropriate requirements, here's the language to bring, sit down with the county attorney on and discuss, do we need to make any additional changes to this to put this into the contract with this person or to the RFP before we get it. Um, the same thing with the, the high requirements and the, the low requirements. Um, and just some language about uh, their current coverage. Uh, and th this again goes to the issue of that you want to make sure that depending on the types of insurance that they have, that insurance is going to be in place when the claim comes. Uh, because when we start talking about um, the certificate of insurance, one of the things you've got to look for is, is that claim, or is that insurance occurrence-based or claims-made? If it's occurrence-based, then you just got to make sure that that policy is in place the day that they're working or the day of the event. If it's claims made, you need to make sure that that policy extends and is kept in force until um, such time that they can't make a claim anymore, a claim can't come against you. So at least a year for the government entity. People have to give you notice of a claim within a year. But even at that, a notice of claim to an insurance company isn't a suit. So you should make sure that they have those policies in place minimum of two years after the work is actually completed or the event is over. Okay. So that is when we're dealing with contracts. Now we have the same thing when we deal with events. So again, here's a list of all the different types of events that might happen on county property. Uh, anniversary parties, uh, auctions, banquets, book signings, faith bridal showers, chamber of commerce events. And again, each one of them identifies what the level of risk is. And because it's a, a, an event on the county property, I've also identified the ones where um, you can use the tenant user liability insurance program. Many of you use that Odd. Some of you use it sparingly, some of you don't use it at all. Again, that's a policy that we've already put in place for each one of the counties. So it's a, a county's policy that then you add, or, or people pay, to be added onto your policy for their event that they're having. And if it's a standard to low risk event, most of the events that would happen at the county fairgrounds, um, they can use this tenant liability, this tenant liability um, insurance, insurance policy of yours to cover that risk. And it's, it's going to cover them for a million, for a million dollars. Um, and that, that way, again, a lot of these people don't have insurance. What they're doing at the fair is not what they do during the day. They don't have a business. So rather than have them go out and buy a special policy for the couple of days of the event, you just simply have them, uh, and, and beginning the first of the year, we should have everything set up where you'll just give them the website and your policy number so that they can go online, they fill in their information about their event, it automatically tells them how much it's gonna cost them to be added to your policy for that event, and they can pay with a credit card, then it sends them a certificate of insurance, sends you a certificate of insurance, and they're ready to go. Uh, so it'll identify if, if you can use the TULIP, if you can't. Um, there, there are others that uh, will require that they have more insurance. Um, but as you can see, a lot of these types of events. Okay. Awkward question, why is bingo a medium risk? Okay. 
Haven't you seen some of those video games? Sixteen boards. You generally have a lot of people there, so the premise liability is, is pretty high. Just trips and falls and things mm -hmm. of that sort. Yeah, and, and you're kind of controlling the environment. You're setting up the chairs and the tables and, and all of that. Um, you, you're doing fire prevention at the building, things like that. So there, there's a little bit more risk there than an outdoor where they're just setting like up their level. level. Yeah. yeah. Just a <laughs> so, uh, a lot of these, what I did was take what the TULIP underwriter identifies them as. If they're low, medium, or high risk. So they kind of coordinate with those of you who have done the TULIP and you've gone through and tried to identify if it's a class one, class two, or class three risk. Low, high, medium. It's the same thing. How many TULIPs have you done for casino nights? <laughs> Not a lot. <laughs> but again, we're, I'm, I'm trying to be, be ready. You know, there might be a juggler. Um, so, <laughs> threw it in there. No uh, yodeler. You know, if you're going to have a yodeler, let me know. <laughs> I don't want to be there. <laughs> okay. So, that's the, those are the risk matrices. And for those of you who deal with the fair and, and deal with contracts, uh, you know, this will be available on the website, and it's a work in progress because, again, you guys will all think me and find risks that I didn't contemplate when I put this together. Um, so we'll, we'll just keep on working on it as we go. Is this a, is this a new brainchild, or did you tell our fair folks about this in the fair? I have shared it with some of the fair people. Um, I know Emory County just implemented it for their fair because they were real concerned they really didn't have anything to control who was what they were asking for from whom. So they, by default, they rarely asked anybody for anything. Mm -hmm. So they, but they needed that justification behind it. So the commissioners, because we've had issues too, where our commission has been saying, well, you know, we don't want to force Joe, Joe Schmo to do this much insurance and this person to do this much money and doing, you know, right? So, right, so this would be a good guy for us. Right? And when you build a wonderful event center, it just creates even more need <laughs> for it. Yes. That's good. Great. So, to, to wrap up so we can get to lunch, um, the last piece of the process, now you've uh, identified the risks, you've identified what insurance you're going to ask for, you've got the identification language in the, in the contract, um, and now you want to make sure that they are following the requirements of, of the contracts and the RFP, so you get their certificate of insurance. Um, now, the certificate of insurance is just simply certification from their insurer that on the date that they issue that, the person has the insurance shown on the certificate. That's it. It doesn't create any rights for you. It doesn't uh, modify their coverage. It doesn't endorse anything onto it. It doesn't add you as an additional insurer. It may indicate that you're named as an additional insurer. But if there's not an endorsement on the policy that names you an additional insured, you're not. And the certificate is not something you can walk into court with and say, no, I'm an additional insured. Uh, only an endorsement under this Utah Certificate of Insurance Act, not only are you not insured, but they're in violation of the act for having done a certificate that shows you as an additional insured without actually endorsing the policy. Our law requires that. So a lot of insurance companies now don't want to put anything about additional insured on a certificate to make sure they're not in violation of the act. They'll send you the certificate and an, a copy of the endorsement naming you additional insured or their endorsement that says anybody that our insured enters into a contract to indemnify them is automatically an additional insured, which is the way we do it for you. If you agree to in writing ahead of time, to identify someone else, they're automatically, if they get sued for what you did, then we're going to cover them too. We're going to cover that contractual liability, is what we call it. We don't call it additional insurance. Question? Well, yeah, we did this once upon a time, we had some private haulers helping us haul gravel and stuff. And 
we require the certificates of insurance and all that good stuff. We keep getting those periodically from different yeah, they're not doing any service for you. The only the only thing I'd say is if they had done something for you that you might still get sued for. So it's they finished up the project six months ago, but you don't know if that road that they repaired is going to fail and somebody's going to get hurt. To have their new certificate of insurance with their new insurance company and, and the policy number is a good idea. But if they did work for you 10 years ago and they haven't done it, search it with file. And you can, you can call the insurance company and tell them to put some updates yeah. to them. Yeah, because yeah, a lot I've of been insurance. Bugging in that much, yeah. A lot of insurance. I, I get a lot too. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> So some things with the certificate of insurance. We need to look at what the limits are that they're providing, the aggregate limits, um, whether that's per project, per policy, per project, or per location. Um, we need to look at the excess umbrella limits, if they're using that to get to the full amount that you're requiring. Um, occurrence versus claims made, uh, coverages and exclusions, additional insured status, um, and then uh, the Certificate of Insurance Act restrictions. Um, we'll start with the Insurance Act restrictions first because a lot of risk managers over the years have said um, in their contracts, you will provide a certificate of insurance and you will amend the language on the certificate of insurance to say that it does create a contractual obligation um, to me in this language up here, and it will also notify me down here that, um, that the policy has been canceled or altered or additional exclusions have been added to it. And that worked for a while. The insurance industry has started to say no and the, the Utah Certificate of Insurance Act, uh, when that was passed a couple years ago, also says no. A, a company's certificate of insurance has to be approved by the Commissioner of Insurance. Once their form has been approved, it cannot be altered. They're not going to alter their certificate of insurance for your circumstances. So if that was your practice to ask them to, to you can ask them for a copy of what they use for a certificate of insurance, but most of them that I've seen now in Utah as a result of that clearly state it doesn't create any contractual obligation and they're not going to change that language. The policy is the policy. And as far as the cancellation notice, it, it says, we'll notify you in accordance with what the policy says. So don't ask to amend a certificate, ask them to amend their policy language that an additional insured shall be notified upon cancellation or revocation of the policy. That's what needs to be done. Um, again, uh, up here, um, the insured, make sure that the person that you're working with is the person that's insured. I see this all the time that the certificate comes in for ABC drilling and you know, ABC drilling is the, is the company that uh, the county's working with but the name insured on the certificate comes in as, you know, Hulkinson Contractor. It's like, why is an ABC providing the policy? Oh, well, they're additional insured on Hulkinson's policy. That, no. So now you've got a certificate where you're the additional insured to an additional insured who doesn't even have a policy. So watch who, who's there. Um, the information on the producer, the agent, and stuff, that's just when we get the claim, Corby will know who to call. Um, it'll name all the different companies that are involved, and we'll usually have a couple of different companies here because a lot of commercial, insur uh, commercial insurers will have their general liability with one cover company, their workers' comp certainly with a different company, their blanket or um, umbrella coverage with yet another insurance company. So just kind of pay attention to which boxes um, th these are filled out as if, uh, and which is the carrier so that you know uh, is it a reliable carrier or not. Um, in this section, you're going to get all the information on what the policy is that they have. So you have your general liability, and here it shows that it's a commercial general liability policy that is occurrence-based. 
So again, for an event, this is, this is great because as long as that policy was in place on the date of the event, doesn't matter when the claim is made, it's going to pay. Um, for you dealing with that person, that's good to have occurrence-based coverage. Do they often put a, a date specific on there, or just when they say occurrence, so whenever I'm running my back or whatever, is that kind of idea? Um, generally, the insurer isn't going to do that. If you ask for extra stuff, like you want a, an endorsement for a special operation, then they may limit that endorsement to a certain period of time. That that endorsement only runs for the week of affairs, something like that. So that, that, that may be noted here in the, in the description section. Um, so we know whether it's occurrence or claims made. Again, if it's claims made, that's not bad. Um, for the insured, that's a good thing that, to be claims made because if they increase their policy limits, they've decided that you know, we used to only buy a million dollars of coverage, and boy, looking around, I think we really need to have five. When they buy that five million dollar policy, now the claim that happened a year ago is got a five million dollar limit on it, rather than the one million dollar policy that they had in place when it when that claim occurred. So, as an insured, it's better to have claims made. As someone dealing with someone who's coming to your fair, in particular, the occurrence base is, is, is easier for you to see. But if they have claims made, oops, that's okay. Just, uh, just again, have them in the requirements that they need to keep that policy, maintain that policy, or have a different claims made policy with at least as much coverage and limits um, uh, for a certain period of time, however long you think they need to have that, that a claim might come. They can file a claim against you within a year with, with the notice provision, year and a half. Um, it's four years in the federal courts, so it's not a bad idea to require them to keep it in place for four years if you're worried about civil rights violations and stuff. Um, and, and of course, consider minors. How, how long, if it's an event with a lot of minors, you might want them to have them in place for 10 years if it's claims made. That's why they would generally buy a occurrence based form. Okay. Um, also, there you can see that they'll usually add any endorsements here. So, here they've identified that they have contractual. What contractual means is they have contractual liability, which means now you don't need to ask to be named an additional insured because as long as the contract says they're going to indemnify you that's written and signed prior to the loss, that contractual liability is triggered and you're in as good a status as additional insured. Now, there's a lot of discussion about additional insured status. Some carriers are really tightening down on they don't like adding a bunch of people as additional insured. As public agencies, uh, it's, it's really questionable whether or not you always want to be named additional insured for two reasons. If you're additional insured, this is kind of your policy too. So when you have a trouble with the named insured, and you decide you need to sue the named insured, do you get to sue your spouse on your auto policy? <laughs> you're going to have trouble suing under a policy that you're named on. So that's one reason that you should consider whether or not you want to be named additional insured. The other argument for government agencies is, some courts have, have found that um, you no longer have tort caps or immunity. Specifically tort caps because you're not paying the claim. This insurance company is going to pay the claim. And if that insurance company is going to pay the claim, that insurance company doesn't have immunity and that insurance company doesn't have tort limitations, they're going to make them pay the full amount of the policy. So you may be waiving your tort limitations by way of the policy. It, as long as the policy pays, okay. Um, but it's still not good practice to, to waive your immunities or tort caps in any situation. So again, that's something to discuss with your county attorney as far as whether or not you're comfortable with doing that. Right. Right. 
When you're talking about minors, so is there not a statute of limitations on claims or anything like that? I mean, when you're talking about minors coming back and suing you down the road, is there any kind it, of limitation? A, a minor, if a minor is injured at your county fair, they have one year from the date that they turn 18 to file a notice of claim against you. Okay. As if, so it's as if their claim happened on their 18th birthday. But there is some kind of limit. I mean, they can't like yeah. get fall like you sponsor Lily uh, football and they down the road they're old and elderly and they're saying they got a concussion back then and they're also whatever. They can't they can't go that long. Can they, they? They they have under the uh, for injuries under the Utah law they have a year from the date that they knew or should have known that they have a claim. So yeah, they, we have these people every now and then that show up and say, I didn't realize I had a brain injury for the last 20 years. Yeah. But now I need a lot of money for the brain injury that I had for this accident I had with the county 20 years ago. The courts have generally said no. Okay. Okay. You, you knew that the injury occurred. You should have brought a claim. And you never so there is a little bit of protection there for long terms. Okay. Yeah, there is. And, and the courts have been very strict on that. There have been lots of cases. There's a case against a school district, a case against a city, and a case against a county, and a case against the state now that have all gone to the Supreme Court, and all of them were one day late. And the court said, sorry, a day is a day. No claim. You're gone. You're done. So, you know, we, and we watch that really close um, to make sure that uh, we're catching that. Um, okay finish up here because I'm standing between you and lunch. So um, again, there's a separate section for the auto liability. Um, so make sure that you're asking, when, especially if you're putting in your contracts, that we want general liability with an aggregate no more than two million, and auto liability with an aggregate no more than two million, or no less than two million. Don't say general liability and auto liability general and auto liability with an aggregate of two million that's less and they are two separate policies Matt, did you have a no i'm talking about we yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, now when you first get this in and you may look at the limits here and if you ask you know this one says two million and you may have asked for three um and you say well that's not enough you remember to look down under the umbrella or excess liability insurance, because they may only buy a million, and typically, if they have a standard commercial uh, business owner's policy, that's what they're gonna have is a million dollar policy, and any limits they need in addition to that, they're gonna buy an excess policy for. Um, that's not bad, especially if the, the general liability policy might be a, uh, uh, a per occurrence, because this one is a per policy. So the aggregate of two million is per policy. So if they had a bunch of claims earlier in the year, again, that two million dollars might be gone before you even have them on site. Um, but if they they have a million dollar aggregate here, and then they have they bought an excess policy specifically for your event, that's good because they can't spend that limit somewhere else. Is there a way to know? How far into their aggregate they might be when you can get your certificate? You can put into your agreement that they, they must have, that, that they can't have eroded the limit more than a certain amount. So when you say um, we want a million dollars per occurrence, no less than $2 million annual aggregate, and that aggregate, you if it's eroded to less than a million, you must buy an additional policy, something along those lines. And again, that's why you really got to watch those aggregates because, again, the counties aren't used to that. You know, our coverage, the coverage that you guys have, we pay every claim. There is no aggregate um, for all the state claims. So you never run out of coverage. The insurance industry, you, all, you run out of coverage if you hit that aggregate. Um, so consider that, that th these people don't have an unlimited amount of insurance. The, the, the limit doesn't apply just to each individual claim. There's a 
There is a bucket that can run dry. So that's the certificate. Those are the, the main things that I see that are questions on the certificate of insurance as they come in. Um, any others that you guys regularly deal with that you want to try and clear up right now? They all going to look similar to this, the ones I've seen. Yeah. This is the standard Accord uh, version. Uh, most insurance companies use Accord forms for applications, certificates, all sorts of things. So it will look, excuse me, it will, it will be an Accord form or it will look very similar to it. Here in Utah, again, because the commissioner needs to a, a, approve the form, that drove a lot of insurance carriers to decide to use the Accord form in Utah because it's simple and they don't have to get their specialized form approved and re-approved every time they make one change to it. Okay, so just understand again, they can cancel this policy the day after. So don't collect them months ahead of the fair. Collect them just before the event or the contract or the day that they arrive on site. Because uh, I, I also see them all the time that they, they send them right after the contract sign and they're not gonna start work for a couple months and the policy actually expires before they're going to be on site and doing the work. So that certificate doesn't help you at all. Great. Good. With that, I think, are you feeling better about dealing with people that you have to ask for insurance from? Hopefully, hopefully you are. And again, I'm always available to, to answer questions when you run into an odd situation where you misplace.